Uh, I'd like to call to order the uh, Wildwood Early Childhood Center Building Committee, uh, 6.38 p.m. on Tuesday, June the 25th. Uh, we have a lot to get to this evening, uh, but first uh, we will uh, formally call to order this meeting through roll call. Uh, this meeting is being uh, recorded. Uh, we have, uh, as just as a point of reminder, provided uh, access uh, via the Zoom link for this meeting to ensure that our community as a whole has the ability to join the meeting. Uh, the web link specifically for uh, those members of the community has been provided on the district's website as well as on the agenda that was publicly posted this evening. With that, Vivian, if you could kindly take us through roll, roll call, please. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Diane Allen. Here. Greg Bendel. Here. Kate Bissell. Here. Glenn Brand. Here. Alice Brown Legrand. Kevin Kyra. Mike Camosio. Here. Uh, Nick Golden. Here. Thank you. Justin Kusha. Here. Marianne Galezzo. Here. Christine Holleran. Here. John, oh, thank you, Christine. John Holloway. Dennis Kelly. Here. Paul Melarani. Craig Miner, Christine Pendergast, here. David Ragsdale, here. Paul Ruggiero, here. Uh, Stacy Scott, uh, Judy O'Connell, here. Eric Schlegel oh, and myself, Vivian. Thank you. Thanks, Vivian. Thank you, everyone. Uh, first order of business tonight, um, item number two is the approval of minutes from the May 28th, 2024 meeting. Uh, we were looking for a motion tonight to approve those minutes, again, from the minutes of uh, May 28th, 2024. So moved. Thank you. Do we have a second? I'll second. second. Thanks, uh, Ms. Allen. Okay, we have a second. Uh, so, um, any discussion? So, with that, uh, again, uh, as per our, our procedures, we'll do a roll call for approval. Thank you. Diane Allen? Yes. Greg Bendel? I'll abstain. We had selectmen that night. Kate Bissell? I also abstain. I was not present. Glenn Brand? Yes. Nick Golden? Yes. Michael Camosio? Yes. Thank you. Justin Couchet? Yes. Marianne Galezzo? I'm going to abstain also. I wasn't present. Christine Holleran? Yes. Dennis Kelly? Yes. Paul Melarani? Uh, Christine Pendergast? Yes. Uh, David Ragsdale? Yes. Paul Ruggiero? Yes. And myself, Vivian Verbedian. Great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, very much, everyone. Um, just a, a quick note for those. Uh, we do have some members of the public, uh, the community they're attending tonight, which is great and nice to see. Uh, this meeting, as is all of our meetings, will uh, come to a point a little bit later uh, tonight to allow for public comment. So uh, if you're joining us and watching, stay tuned. There certainly will be an opportunity for that uh, a little bit later in tonight's agenda. Uh, but first we'll uh, move to item number three tonight and that's a design update. Uh, we have continued to work very hard with um, uh, our designer team, Doran Whittier. Just as a reminder again for members of the committee at, as a whole, uh, we have a, a leadership working group that meets weekly with our design team and our OPM along with representatives from the school district, uh, as well as the town. Um, and, uh, and so uh, this is a, 
constant effort that we are uh, uh, made up, uh, made aware of. And tonight we'd like to provide an opportunity to bring everyone up to speed on uh, the work that is ongoing. So with that, Ronnie, I think it's over to you. Ronnie, you're muted right now. Sorry, I was looking for my yeah. control panel there. And, I lost and, it when I shared and, the screen. And maybe, Thank Ronnie, you, Dr. Maybe, Brent. <laughs> maybe, Ronnie, just before you start, if we could, because I know we have a few uh, members who are joining us uh, for the first time. Um, and for those of the community that might be watching, could uh, you and your team just uh, take a moment to introduce yourself, if you would, please? Sure, we can. Uh, hi, and good evening, everybody. My name is Ronnie Phillip. I'm with Dorr and Whittier Architects. We are the designer for the Wilmington Wildwood School project, and I am the project manager for our team. Thanks, Ron. Good evening, everybody. I'm Lee Dorr. I'm uh, one of the principals at Dorr and Whittier. Thanks so much, Lee. Uh, Jason, I see you here. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jason Boone. I'm an educational facility planner with Dorr and Whittier. Thank you. And just as a reminder for our community members, we are welcoming back uh, Doran Whittier. Uh, they were uh, also the design team on the Wilmington High School, uh, much beloved building uh, in this community, as I've certainly come to learn. Um, and just very quickly, we also have our owners project manager here, who's uh, Julie Leduc tonight. Good evening, everyone. Julie Leduc, the OPM for this project. And with me is also Sarah Traniello, our assistant project manager. Thanks all. Okay. Sorry, Ronnie. Uh, thanks for your patience. And back to you. Thank you, Dr. Brand. If everyone can hear and see me okay, we'll get started. Um, so today we wanted to give you an update on the design. As we've mentioned previously, we have gone from the preliminary design phase where we were drawing with, as I like to describe, a thick Sharpie. And we have been working diligently to refine each of the shortlist options from the PDP phase. And we are going to share that with you tonight. So for those that are new to this um, call, I just wanted to uh, remind everyone we are looking at three grade configurations. There's the pre-KK option, which would include the population at the Wildwood uh, early Childhood Center, the Pre-K-3 option that would include the Wildwood and Woburn Street School, and then a Pre-K-5 option that would look at the Wildwood, Woburn, and North Intermediate Schools. Um, the existing um, square footages are listed on the screen and also where going through the educational visioning process, um, we came up with a proposed square footage at the end of the preliminary design phase. And then now we are working to refine the program. Uh, there was um, some small programmatic changes that have slightly adjusted our numbers. And so those new proposed square footages are located in the column under the PSR proposed. Um, you'll see that there's um, a, a slight uh, change in the square footage, um, mostly due to the reduction of a preschool classroom and also some changes in the music and art uh, delivery. The MSBA guidelines is the column next to the PSR proposed column, and that is the guidelines that MSBA uh, starts their um, uh, guidelines with for a project of that size. Um, and what that doesn't necessarily include are all of the special services that are provided in the district and also uh, pre-KK. Um, so that's where some of the jump between the MSBA guidelines and then what are, is currently being proposed for square footage, um, that's some of the difference that you are seeing. At the end of the PSR phase, we had five options. Sorry, at the end of the PDP phase, we had five options that we had shortlisted as a committee. And um, at the end of the PDP uh, phase, we submit our um, information to the MSBA and they provide feedback. They did ask that the committee include. Um, some additional options for cost comparison to carry through in this phase. So for the purposes of today, 
we will be focusing on the five that uh, were shortlisted and the ones that are not highlighted in the red boxes are the ones that are being carried forward for cost comparison purposes. Uh, as part of the project, we're looking at a repair only at a pre-K um, configuration at the Wildwood site. We're looking at a renovation and addition option uh, for a pre-K-5 population at the North Intermediate site. And we're looking at new um, options at all three sites for all three configurations. This is the pre-K-5 new construction option at the North Intermediate site. Uh, this is where the plan was left at the end of the PDP phase. And this is the plan now um, updated for this PSR phase. Um, during this phase, we were able to meet with public uh, safety officials, including police and fire. Uh, we were able to take some feedback from them and incorporate it into um, the site plan as well as look at some of the grades, um, some further consideration of location for um, potential geothermal wells, circulation around the site, and um, just the location of the building was, uh, the footprint of the building was more refined and so we were able to adjust some of the um, circulation patterns. As you can see here, the building is set back into the site. Um, the Parking is located along the streets from Ballardville as well as Salem Street. There's circulation patterns around the site, and again, the building is located um, further back into the site. There are playgrounds on the site as well. There's a pre-K playground located closer to the pre-K wing. There is a lower elementary playground located behind the building as well, and then a upper elementary playground that is actually located at the front of the building. This is a change from the PDP phase. Um, and the thought behind that was that fields have been located here in front of the building, a uh, potential pickleball court located um, closer to Salem Street. And if a community event was happening on the green, we would be able to provide a playground that is accessible at the time of these events, as well as closer to the pickleball courts. So it gives an option for the community to have access to one of the playgrounds potentially um, off hours, and then still have some of the uh, lower elementary playgrounds uh, protected and set behind the building. We also have uh, what is designated as a hardscape play area uh, further back here as well. And then also an open green space that is um, further back uh, in addition to the one that is in front of the building. One additional change you will see here is this emergency access from Arlene um, Avenue. This was a direct result of the conversations with public safety. And so this would be for emergency access only. It would be, um, you know, uh, protected with a gate or bollards or something of the sort um, that would only have some sort of accessibility with um, public safety. There are a couple of other security um, gates as well, one located in this area and then another one located in this area on the site. This is the circulation patterns to give you an understanding of how uh, movement would happen on site. During drop-off, we're proposing that um, vehicles would enter in from Salem Street. They would um, follow the loop, be able to do drop-off here at the main entry, and then continue out to Salem Street. Uh, parents or um, guardians that are dropping off pre-kindergarten students could enter in the site. They would actually continue to the left where there is a pre-K entrance and some parking for um, special services and for pre-K um, guardians as well in the event that they want to walk into the building with the pre-K students. The buses would actually enter from Ballardvale Street. They would enter in they would follow the road, and there is a turnaround during drop-off and pickup only. 
and they would follow this around and be able to drop students off either at the cafeteria or at the main entry and then exit out of Ballard Bell Street. Um, this plan allows for complete separation of the vehicles from the buses during drop off. Um, and they could use the same pattern during pickup as well. If there was a concern that the queue length of the um, vehicles in, from Salem Street during pickup was an issue, then there is the option to um, alternate at pickup and actually use the back entrance off of Ballard Vale for the um, vehicles and then have the buses enter in from Salem Street. Uh, the turnarounds are all sized for buses so that um, that alter, alternate route could be um, followed if needed. This is the first floor plan. Um, it hasn't changed um, from our last meeting, but I will highlight that the area on the right is more of the public zone. The area on the left is the academic zone for the classroom wings. There are security thresholds to separate uh, the public and academic wings. Um, one is located here where my red uh, laser is, and then the second one is here entering into the pre-K wing. Administration is located by the main entry. You have your cafeteria, your gymnasium, and then some of the back of house functions um, to the north. And then this hallway here would actually also be part of the public zone so that for after hours events, the toilets are accessible. And I will also point out that the vestibule and entry for pre-K uh, is located uh, adjacent to the pre-K wing. On the second floor, you have two academic wings to your left, and then in the public zone, you would have the library, the STE classroom, and the health classroom. The upper floor um, has three grades, um, a wing to the north and south that follow um, the levels below, and then the connection of this uh, last grade uh, in the center here. This works out because the gymnasium is below it, so it provides for um, the double story space below to support uh, this area. The Pre-K-5 Ad Reno is um, a four-story building. This is where we landed at the end of the PDP phase. This is the updated site plan at, uh, that we are currently working with. As you can see, the building portion here is a, a renovated section, and then there are two new classroom wings as well as the uh, gymnasium addition. Um, both pre-K-5 options do carry the 6,000, uh, sorry, the 12,000 square foot gymnasium. On this plan, there is circulation um, that is currently in use off of Salem Street that we will continue to use. There is um, a new parking area that is located behind the building, and then fields are located um, to the west. Pickleball courts and a hardscape area are also located in this area. For circulation during drop-off, you would have buses entering off of Ballard Vale. They would come and loop through the parking lot. They would be able to drop students off at the back entrance and exit out onto Ballard Vale. And uh, vehicles would enter in through Salem Street and be able to drop off at the main entry. Pre-K um, guardians would be able to park and drop students off at the pre-K entry and all would exit out again onto Salem Street. Here again, um, circulation is separate for vehicles and the bus. However, um, the queue length for um, pickup would definitely be a concern. And so we propose that um, they could swap for pickup and the 
guardians would use the parking lot loop off of Ballardvale and buses potentially could use the entry from Salem Street. Pre-K could potentially use um, the same entry. However, um, it does conflict with the buses. And so an alternate would be to use the smaller parking lot as a pickup uh, alternative. Also on this site plan, uh, I will point out that uh, emergency access only from Arlene Avenue has also been incorporated. This is the lower level of the pre-K-5 ad reno. The area where you're seeing um, a lot of the mechanical and the kitchen are uh, renovated areas from the existing building. And then you have a new kindergarten classroom wing, which allows kindergarten to egress um, at grade level. You have the gymnasium with access points and toilet rooms accessible for after hours use. And there is a sec security threshold uh, separating that academic wing, wing from the public areas. The cafeteria is also located on this level. On the upper level, we have um, the main entry. This is at grade at the main entry here. And then you also have that secondary access point uh, for pre-K, which is why they are located on the uh, level above here. And then you would have likely first grade above the kindergarten. There is opportunity to potentially have kindergarten at this level, but that would drop um, the first grade to uh, the lower level. Also in the public area, we have um, the art and music as well as library. Level three and four have academic wings um, and they repeat where you have two classroom wings, one to the north and one to the south. And again, here is the top level. We'll switch to the Woburn Street site and look at the pre-K-3 option. This is the new construction at the PDP level. And this is the refined option where we're at now. Here you can see the building is um, lightly shown where the existing building is located. And for this project um, to work, we would have to provide a new construction north of the building to try not to interrupt um, the function of the existing, existing school. The new building would be constructed first, similar to the pre-K-5 new construction, and then the existing building would be demolished for completion of site work. On this site, you have um, all fields located on the southwest area of the site, and parking would be located where the existing building is now. And then what you are seeing here is the upper level of the second floor on the right-hand side, that's the public zone. And then what is shown on the left-hand side is the lower level to show that there would be egress on the lower level for pre-K and K. Um, there is a considerable grade change on this site, and so we're trying to take advantage of that with this solution. So from High Street, this would look like a one-story building, but in fact, the lower level is recessed um, due to the grade change. The dashed line that you're seeing here is of the main level above. So here, because we have five grades that we are um, placing on this site, K, uh, K and pre-K would be located on the lower level, but you would have to have three grades on the upper level. So this would be an over, um, an overhang, if you will, um, and it is over what would be the circulation route. So bus loop, um, the buses that are following the bus loop would actually travel under the building uh, when accessing the site. I will also actually point out this is the parent parking. And then here closer to the pre-K wing, we have a separate uh, pre-K uh, parent access point. For drop-off and pickup, um, the buses would enter in off of Woburn Street. They would follow the path around, go under the building in this one portion, and um, be able to drop off students in front of the cafeteria. And they could also do pickup at the same location. 
for vehicles for um, the elementary students. They would enter in off of Woburn Street. They would go through the parking lot into the loop and drop off at the main entry and then um, exit out back onto Woburn Street where pre-K student, the pre-K um, drop off would um, continue um, to the lower back area here and they would have their own separate entry into the pre-K wing and then they would be able to egress out and follow the traffic back to Woburn Street. So on the Woburn Street site, due to some of the site constraints, the grades are obviously a challenge. Um, the entry is the same on the site, but the egress points are different for buses and vehicles. This is the main level where you can see the uh, administration and the public zone on the right-hand side, and then the academic wing on the left-hand side. All of the public um, areas are on the same level, and you would have um, security thresholds um, to separate the public and academic wings. The gymnasium for the pre-K-3 is the 6,000 square foot gymnasium, shared stage with the cafeteria, uh, and then a library that is a two-story space, but it is located um, centrally um, to the academic wings, as well as to the public area. This is the lower level, which would have the pre-K wing to the south and the um, kindergarten wing to the north, allowing for direct egress uh, to the fields. This is the pre-KK new construction at the Wildwood site. This is the refined plan. Um, here we did do a shift. Let me just go back real quick here. Uh, in the PDP iteration, there was no separation of the public and private areas. And part of the PSR development, uh, we were able to uh, refine this plan to provide uh, a somewhat of a separation between the public and academic areas. You'll see here, this is the public area to the west and then to the northeast, you have the academic areas. The one difference is that the library is set into the academic area as well as the art and music spaces. Also on this site for Wildwood, we were able to shift the building uh, slightly more to the south and therefore provide a little bit more space north of the building. And you have entry into the site um, and parking at, at the front of the building. And then you have some green space further back um, but the main play area and green space for um, the students would be in this location here. For drop off and pick up, you have the everyone entering in in the same location. For vehicles, they would enter into a lane directly upon entering into the site and follow the traffic pattern, be able to drop off at the main entry and exit out into uh, onto Wildwood Street. The pre-K would enter in, but they would follow a separate loop that would take them closer to the entry of the pre-K wing um, with the ability to park and drop off as needed and then join the vehicles and exit out onto the site. And then buses would enter in at that same point, but they would follow around the building and be able to drop off closer to the cafeteria. Uh, and this would be closer for the kindergarten wing. And then they would continue and exit out at a separate point. This is the floor plan. It's a one story building. You enter in off of um, at this main entry point. You have administration, the gymnasium, a stage and cafeteria. The cafeteria would be open to serve as a connection between the um, north and south side of the buildings. You have the pre-K wing to the north and the kindergarten wing to the south and then connected again with the media center and the music and art. They would have a courtyard space as well.
So I'll pause there. I know um, that was a lot of information, <laughs> a lot of updates that some of you may not have seen. Um, so I'll pause here to see if there's any questions. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Ronnie. And thank you for uh, taking us through that. It's a refinement, obviously, of what um, the committee saw, the building committee saw at our last meeting, uh, going from that sharp fat marker, I think, as you said, to the skinny and the and the refinement and also um, continuing to try and work down the overall square footage and tighten things up, which I know we've obviously talked at some length about. Um, there's a lot of folks that I, uh, I know, obviously, on this committee. And so if you can, uh, if you have questions on this before we shift to the evaluation metrics uh, matrix, if you could kindly raise your uh, your hand, I think that will help identify uh, me to then call on you. Michael, I see you up first with a question. So please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Brand. So thank you, Ronnie, for going through the options. As I look at the pre-K to three at, you know, the new at Woburn, and I consider comments and, and good feedback from Dennis at the prior meeting, can I assume it wouldn't be overly difficult to make it a three-story building, removing that overhang and put a third level to the south that would still only appear to be a two-level building from Woburn Street? Just thinking of the complexity of that overhang and the layout and um, to me, it would seem rather costly to build that overhang. Is that an option? So if we did add the that third um, grade to the upper level, they would just be isolated on the upper floor, which didn't necessarily follow the educational plan. The idea was that, um, you know, grades would be grouped together. So, you know, pre-K and K, um, one, two, and three at the pre-K three configuration or be, you know, for the pre-K five, um, you know, the fourth and fifth grade, for example. So um, it could be done. Um, it's just that it didn't necessarily follow uh, the educational plan. And so we were trying to keep them um, with our cohorts, if you will. Thank you. Th and thanks, I, Michael. Yep, I sorry, could just add one other thing. I uh, Thank you, Dr. Brent, is that um, one of the things I didn't necessarily mention, but that um, having that overhang, if you will, it um, provides for a covered um, hardscape area for play during inclement weather. So that was one of the ways that we looked at it as well. Just, uh, just a friendly reminder for those members who are not on the committee, but who are here in attendance tonight from the community. Um, there certainly will be an opportunity for comments or questions when we get to that portion of the meeting. Uh, that'll be just in a little bit. So just hang tight if you, if you do. Um, before we move on to the evaluation metric uh, matrix, are there any other questions from members of the committee for Ronnie or members just, of her team? Just, just a clarification, um, Mr. Brand, did that uh, the Wuben Street um design you showed was that the pre-k to five or the pre-k to three i you i was a little uh confused, sure that, I guess on that. that is a pre-k three at the woburn street site that you that you showed tonight correct okay thank you Mr. Um, any other questions from members of the yes committee? dr brand Diane. Sure. yes thanks Diane. So. yes hi um i just and maybe I missed it, but is there a, did she give, did Ronnie, Ronnie give the um, square footage of the buildings with the options that we just uh, evaluated? Yes, they were at the outset. Maybe Ronnie, you could go back to that slide. Okay. I see. All right. So, and, and we're looking at my, if um, the uh, PDP proposed, is that correct for the square footage of the so building? We've so we've updated. Um, so we're currently in this phase here, the PSR phase. So the, so PS the square footage of the building are um, in this column that and we're that currently working with. Yeah, okay. there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of numbers on, on here, certainly, but yeah, just really to go through it, right? From the, the existing, that's the current square footage of those respective buildings on their own right now. Um, correct, Ronnie, right? Wildwood only is 29,000 and change. Wildwood and Woburn combine are 83,000. And then all three schools combine are 138,000. 
again, for those that there's a lot of acronyms I know that are weaving their way in, can you just remind committee members the difference between the PDP and the PSR, Ronnie? Sure. So MSBA um, has a phase called the feasibility study phase. That's when we are looking at many options and trying to um, refine and study potential sites, potential configurations on multiple sites. And so you have many options that you start with. Um, it's a very high level study. Uh, we look at the conditions of the existing buildings as well. And we you know, go through and study each of the existing buildings to understand their current condition because um, MSB, MSBA requires us to look at a repair only option and then also the ad reno option. So we do need to understand what is currently on site. And then um, we propose repair only ad renovation and new construction options for the different configurations. So you know, for uh, this committee, we had 18 different options that we ended up looking at and four different sites in the PDP phase. And then at the end of the PDP phase, um, we went through the evaluation process and shortlisted. Um, at the PSR, which is the second part of the feasibility study phase for MSBA, is we take the shortlisted option and we try to refine and study them in further detail as much as possible with any of the information that we have and we are, are expected to go from the few options to one option that would then be um, studied for uh, further development in what would be called the next phase schematic design. And um, I see, uh, or it'll be really just, just one moment. The MSBA guidelines, I think, I know you said it at the outset, but again, for those that are maybe watching and, and certainly as a reminder for committee members, um, because uh, it's very understandable that there's a difference here between the MSBA guidelines and that of um, and that of the existing plan that's unfolding. But there are some important things to keep in mind that account for that difference. And can you just remind us of those, Ronnie, again, please? Sure. So the MSBA guidelines, they um, require us to uh, track all of the program that would be in the buildings um, on a spreadsheet. And part of that spreadsheet is we know where, what the existing program is and the sizes of them. We, per, we know what the proposed um, program is. And then MSBA gives certain guidelines for what they consider um, for a project. And uh, it's all based on the enrollment. So as part of the early stages of this process with MSBA was coming to an agreed upon enrollment. And so we actually have three space summaries is what they're called. Um, and for each of the grade configurations that you see, the pre-K, -K, pre-K three and pre-K five, um, we input the enrollment into the spreadsheet and then it gives us guidelines um, for classroom spaces, the size of cafeteria, gymnasium, the number of classrooms, the number of art and music classrooms, for example, the size of the media center. It's all generated through formulas um, based on the enrollment that is entered onto the spreadsheet. What's not included is all of the specifics for um, Wilmington to provide their educational program, which would also include the special education services that are provided as well as pre-K. Um, and that's kind of the, the quick version of that. I don't know if Lee or Jason or Julie no, want to add thanks. to that, but thanks, that thanks. kind of gives you an idea. Uh, Mr. Slagle, our new town manager, welcome. Thanks for being here tonight. I see you have your hand raised. Uh, Thanks, Lynn. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, this is my first meeting, so I want to apologize if I ask questions that that um, <laughs> have been answered at earlier meetings. Um, but I, I did want to drill down a little bit onto this uh, issue that that you were just talking about about the square footage. Um, so, for instance, for the the pre K uh, to three, the MSB gui MSBA guidelines uh, call for just under eighty thousand square feet, and, and we're there's a proposal for an extra thirty five thousand square feet. And so, I, I just want to Correct me if I'm wrong. That 35,000 square feet is for pre-K because that's not included in the, the MSBA guidelines and and other programming for special needs. Is that a, a fair assessment? Yeah, so that is more or less the bulk of that square footage. Um, there's a couple of spaces that MSBA doesn't include. Um, some of the specialist spaces that um, also serve the general population, not just 
um, the special education population. And so they um, do not allow you to carry that under special education. So that falls into a usually the administration category, but then that would then exceed that category. But MSBA just doesn't account for it. So there are some nuances um, in the spreadsheet. And so typically the overage that you see are for a lot of those spaces. Um, but the majority is your special education and pre-kindergarten. Okay. And, and is it is it fair to say on the uh, the proposals that you've put forward, the 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 MSBA guideline square footage is consistent with what's actually in the in each proposal for the spaces that MSBA accounts for? So for instance, in the pre-K to K, they say 23,000 square feet. That that is consistent with what's actually in the in the in the PSR proposed for the things that the MSBA counts. Uh, so that's an interesting question. <laughs> uh, for pre-K K, uh, MSBA doesn't have a spreadsheet. Um, is the okay. Really, it, it's considered an elementary, and so kindergarten doesn't always have a lot of the spaces or use the spaces um, when you have just one grade in the elementary spreadsheet. It just doesn't work the same. Um, they have a grossing factor, for example, that is um, very low when you only have the kindergarten population, for example, and so what you're seeing there, that 23,000 square feet, when you put in the grossing factor of 1.5 is, which is what we um, carry for the PSR phase. Um, that grossing factor would be the corridors, the thickness of the walls, um, storage spaces, um, mechanical spaces, all those things. MSBA groups into what's called this grossing factor. And um, you know, when we correct the grossing factor for the population of the pre-K K. Um, it would actually be probably closer to 40,000 square feet. But um, MSBA, there, because there's no spreadsheet, we've just had to um, indicate that in our narrative to the MSBA as we were um, going through this. And then um, the spaces themselves, we try our best to follow. And for the majority, they will fall within the category of and the guidelines of MSBA unless there is a reason that the district would need a larger space um, or is requesting a larger space um, as part of uh, their um, you know, proposal to MSBA for the program. Um, also, another factor for some of the larger square footage, especially at the pre-K-5, is that um, the gymnasium for the pre-K-5 configuration is actually a 12,000 square foot gymnasium um, to allow for two um, uh, gymnasium uh, or court spaces within the gym. Um, and MSBA actually only provides 6,000 square feet. So if the community continues, chooses to continue with a 12,000 square foot gymnasium, um, that would, that portion, that six extra 6,000 square feet would not be reimbursable by MSBA. Um, so there are some spaces such as the gymnasium that are larger, but for the majority of spaces, we try to um, meet the guidelines of MSBA. Okay, so so, uh, and I apologize. I didn't realize that the pre KK was a special one off. Um, uh, the but for for the pre K to three, for instance, it's fair to say that there's about seventy nine thousand or about eighty thousand square feet of kindergarten, first, second, and third grade space and administrative space that's allowable under the MSBA guidelines in the proposed the PSR proposed. Is that is that fair? And the remaining thirty five thousand is extra. Ronnie, can I can I jump in for yeah, that? Yeah, go for it. So th this this is actually a really really important distinction, right? The difference between what we're proposing and MSBA guidelines is different than what's going to ultimately be eligible or ineligible for MSBA reimbursement. So, for example, in our proposal, Ronnie mentioned all of those special education spaces to support your district specific special education programs many of them exceed the MSBA guidelines because the MSBA guidelines don't have any representation of those spaces at all. However, nearly all 
if not all of those special education spaces will be eligible for reimbursement. And so you can't simply equate the difference between the proposed gross square footage and the MSBA guidelines as what's going to be ineligible. Far more will be eligible for reimbursement than what's depicted in this particular math. And part of our due diligence is to speculate about what will be eligible and ineligible in this phase, right? We never know until the MSBA weighs in for sure, but we've got a pretty good track record of understanding how the MSBA thinks related to this. And, and we'll be speculating about that later on in this uh, PSR phase. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I, I wasn't trying to delve into the reimbursement, but th thanks for that. That's a, that's a good primer. I was just, I guess in, in layman's terms, I was just trying to make sure that the, the massing of these spaces was appropriate as to the MSBA guidelines. And we weren't, they weren't, um, you know, inordinately larger than than needed despite the fact that there's a difference between these these numbers and the and the msba guidelines That's yeah, all in, in, get to. in broad strokes eric i think we can confidently say that we've sized the projects to meet the district's educational needs and that with very few exceptions like the gymnasium right the oversizing of the gymnasium in the pre-k-5 is an example of a perceived community value, not necessarily a strict educational value. And so that's that's one particular decision that's been made. But we've counted staff, we've run through the daily school schedule, we've um, understood you know, how many sections of art, music, PE, right, the project needs, um, all of the individual classroom spaces are within the MSBA expectations. Um, so we've sized all of these projects to meet the district's educational needs and the MSBA guidelines as something that they try to overlay on the entire state where, you know, practices differ from community to community um, is a guideline. It's just that it's not necessarily requirements. It's not necessarily sort of hard and fast rules. Um, so the, the projects are trying to represent what's what's necessary for the educational intent in Wilmington. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, um, thanks, Jason. Uh, thanks for the question, Eric. Um, and uh, just one more point I think is is Im important to keep in mind too when looking at the square footage, which obviously this is important. It's a it's a directional uh, element for cost. Is you know looking and keeping in mind that the existing square footage in our respective three schools, Wildwood, uh, the Woburn Street in the north, in their current configuration as we've discussed, you know, at different times in this project since the since the inception of this project, um, with the time period in which they were built, they currently, uh, they don't have all of the appropriate spaces to deliver education that uh, a district like ours, or quite frankly, any other district would require, built in a very, very different time period. Um, and so uh, it's with, um, it's with the planning with as well the MSBA guidelines to be able to consider including appropriate spaces, not just for special education, uh, but for other related services, physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, and uh, English language learning as an example, that simply are, are spaces that do not exist right now in the Wildwood, Wolverine, or the North. So I just think that's important for, for community folks to, to keep in mind. But we wanna go, um, if we can, back to the next phase of, of this presentation, and that's the evaluation matrix. As everyone's well aware, we, we have a, a number of options that are on the table, um, and uh, we are uh, creeping closer towards the point in time in which, um, by, the, uh, by the guidelines, by the requirements of the MSBA uh, project that we are partnered with, we are going to have to, uh, as a committee, make a decision to put forth one, um, one option from the many uh, to one. And so it's with a sense of trying to bring a, an objective lens to this next phase uh, that will return to the evaluation matrix, something that will uh, be uh, very important for us as a committee and, and our, with our design team to help make this objective decision. So Ronnie, do you wanna run us through this, this next piece? Sure. So the evaluate, evaluation matrix, um, we did have categories that we've looked at in the PDP phase. We will continue to look at those same categories, um, except now we will apply these categories and the several criteria within each of these categories um, to the nine remaining options. We will come back in July with 
the matrix. And this is that matrix that you saw um, at the end of PDP. We will go in and take um, uh, a first pass at scoring each of the updated options um, against the criteria and then um, bringing those back to you for review in the July meeting. So we'll still continue to use the same criteria and categories. We felt that this would um, be an opportunity to have some continuity between the PDP phase and the PSR phase. Um, some communities do choose to uh, refine the criteria, but um, at the end of the day, um, you know, we still have to justify if an option is eliminated, the reasons for it. And so the criteria help us do that. And so um, for continuity, we are proposing that we actually continue with the same uh, evaluation matrix unless anyone feels strongly um, that, you know, a specific criteria, criteria or category was no longer relevant, we could um, have that discussion. But um, from the design team, we are proposing to continue with the same uh, evaluation matrix for moving forward. Thanks, Ronnie. Um, so um, maybe, Julie, if I could ask you to um, uh, just weigh in here to help um, guide the forward thinking of the, of the committee members, knowing that uh, we have this meeting and we have a couple more, but uh, what your uh, recommendation is in terms of how, um, how this process will work uh, and, how, and how this decision will be, will be made. Yeah, so as Ronnie said, um, you know, this is the matrix that we used for the first round of uh, deliberations and shortlisting from 18 down to, we'll call them nine. Really, there's five, but there's four the for cost comparison only. Um, and, uh, you know, the, along with the leadership team, we, we had this conversation about, you know, whether or not we should refine the matrix. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the conversation, we decided that, you know, the continuity was more important um, for the project. Um, so between now and the next meeting, uh, Doran Whittier and SMMA are going to pre-populate this um, matrix and share it with the committee so that everyone has an opportunity to review it on their own. Um, at our next meeting in July, you know, we're going to take that and, and review it with the group um, and make sure that everyone's comfortable with the scoring. Our, the following meeting would be August 20th, and that August 20th meeting is when we really need to determine the um, preferred schematic option. So that the one option that's moving forward. Um, so there's a lot to do between now and then, and Doran Whittier will again be refining even more um, their plans, make sure that everyone has an opportunity to view them. We will have a community forum on August 7th um, where we'll get input from the community as well, um, as well as the event that's happening this week, which is the fun on the fourth. Um, we do have a QR code available as well as um, papers in which people can fill out the questions if they're not comfortable using a QR code. Uh, we'll have members, and, and this will be in the public relations update, but um, all of that data that we're going to receive from the fun on the fourth and from the community forum, we will be able to provide back to this group so that they can know what, what your community at large is saying. And I'm not saying it's a, a representation of all, uh, I believe it's 14,000 members of your community, but it's, you know, the outreach in which that we will do. Uh, Thanks, Julie. Um, sure. Questions from members of the committee on the evaluation matrix? Uh, or the process. Uh, Duck Brand. So. Yes. Um, all these, um, uh, this matrix here, uh, one of the things that is not included, and I don't know whether it should be included at this point or not, uh, but for the July meeting, but something that would be helpful uh, for even the public to understand what about the cost and the implications uh, from reimbursement 
affecting the taxes uh, to be paid by the residents of the town for these projects. Do you think that's an important part of the information, uh, you know, uh, to help us in um, focusing in on which of the options is the best option for the town? Yeah, so thank you for that, Diane. Um, Lee Dor and I have talked about this. Um, once you have a preferred option, that's when the MSBA will allow us to enter all of the information into their spreadsheet, which will then determine what the town's rate, uh, the eligible uh, costs are and what the MSBA's costs are. What we're planning to do is to take, once we have all five of these estimated, again, Lee and I are going to uh, put these into that form as best as humanly possible to get us a range. It will not be, you know, a spot on number. It is not something that is going to be, um, you know, that we would like to be held to, but we'd like to be able to give you all a range that you can understand that. But um, to be able to do that between now and August, I don't think is um, something that we would be able to um, do for certain. Um, I'm gonna let Lee, because he's got his hand raised, weigh in on that statement. Sure, just, just to add to that, Diana, it's, it's a really good point. And I think it's clearly a very important criteria in the selection moving forward. Um, one, one thing that I just might offer as just passing on some experience working with communities that are looking at different grade configurations is much different than if we were just looking at, we've got to do a, a pre-K through three and we've got three options to pick from. We're gonna end up when we go through this evaluation matrix with a clear favorite for each of the different grade configuration categories. I think that'll be pretty clear when we come through the matrix, just like it was at the end of the PDP phase, some options kind of rose above the others. The main difference is really gonna be, you're gonna have educational solutions that meet the feasibility criteria for the site. We're gonna meet the educational program for a pre-KK or a pre-K through three or a pre-K five. They're clearly very different solutions long-term for the town and they're gonna have clearly different price points for the town. So when we're thinking between now and when we have to make a decision in August, we're gonna try and provide the committee with as many tools as we can. Part of that is going to be a range of MSBA reimbursement, and that'll vary between each of the options and you'll be able to see a range of local share taxes versus uh, it's comparative to the other options. So I think it's gonna be a really Clear piece will provide you with that information on the ranges as best we can, as Julie mentioned, so that you can have some good information moving forward. But clearly, these are going to be value judgments for the long term disposition of the town. A pre K 5 solution, right, kind of gets you all the way to what we've heard majoritively throughout this process of consolidation is a good thing. And we'd be looking to do that, but it has a certain price point. And how far we go on that versus, you know, ability, you know, how much can the taxpayers afford versus how much you're going to get in the value, right? That's the big decision that has to be made by August. And we'll try and provide those tools so you can weigh that kind of that investment return for what it is for local share costs, what it is if we do a, a, a new just for pre-KK, what are the long-term costs for the other schools just to try and get apples to apples comparisons, knowing that those repair only jobs are only locally funded. So that'll have a different price point. So for me and other communities that have worked through this, you're gonna have a clear winner for each of these categories. The big decision is gonna be what's the best value for the town. And those are the things that we're gonna to need to be really thinking and discussing, I think between now and August. Thanks Lee. Uh, David first and then Marianne. Uh, I'm curious if, uh, I know we didn't do this in the PDP stage when we were looking at the evaluation matrix, but I'm curious if um, if anyone from SMMA or Leandor have ever worked on a bit of, on a weighted um, matrix, because one thing that about the way that our, the current matrix is, is that all of those nine categories are, are equally weighted. They all, they all count 
uh, you know, the exact same amount. And we may find that some of them matter more to us than others, uh, that maybe the community use is more important than the construction impacts or whatever the case is. Now that that complicates it. And then you could endlessly argue over how much more weight should something get. But I, I was just curious if that's something that you've seen in other communities to try and zero in a little bit more closely on on where the benefits really lie. Thanks, David. Yeah. Uh, Lee or Julie? Yeah, definitely. We, you know, we've done that um, in other communities um, and it's been, you know, effective. I think that when we first started out with this matrix, we had so many different line items that we were pulling from that when we had that conversation about how do we scale this, it really became about, I think, I can't even remember how many line items are in there, Ronnie, probably over 30. Um, There's about 40. <laughs> yeah. And so it became about, you know, making sure that everything was equally weighted. Um, I'm not opposed to the committee deciding what's more important, but I think that that would, may require another meeting um, for us to kind of sit down and, and go through each one of these line items and each one of these categories to determine as a group, which ones are, um, are more of a priority to you. Thanks, Julie. Uh, Marianne. Yeah. I just want to be clear to follow up on Diane's comment. So are you saying that in August you will have a range from what MSBA might give us back? Or are we not expecting that? Yes, <clears throat> we will provide a range of MSBA participation. Knowing that it's our best assumptions and it will potentially change until they weigh in on their final decision. But the best we can do is provide you with tools based on our experience with other projects and the way they've interpreted ineligible versus eligible costs mm -hmm. and all the different other you know mechanisms and levers that they have to be able to come up with that rate. But yes, for August, we will have that. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Marianne. Thanks, uh, Lee. Uh, any other questions from members on the committee on the evaluation matrix? Uh, Dennis. Yeah, I just want to keep think think of this down the road. The decisions we make, whether it's pre K five, pre K three, or uh, pre K K, um, if it's pre K five or pre K three, we're looking at two different educational experiences for kids in town. On on as we look at that, so what we decide as we move forward, if it's only for half town, we may have to look quickly at not quickly, but um, next at that same thing on the opposite side of town to make sure that the educational environments are the same for every student in that same grade configuration. So as we get closer and pick our spots, we've got to think of that um, going forward. Thanks, uh, thanks Dennis. Uh, any other questions on the matrix? Okay, uh, don't see any others. Move on to item number four on the agenda tonight, and that is budget and schedule updates. Thank you. Uh, so for July, you will expect to see the cost estimating happening. Um, we have been preparing uh, the cost estimating package. Our consultants are involved with providing um, some more narrative to clarify scope that will also be considered during cost estimating. And then we will work to uh, fill in that evaluation matrix, take that first pass and share that back with the committee. So um, at the next SBC meeting, uh, we will discuss the evaluation matrix as we've been talking about and also um, likely have uh, the cost estimates to share with you as well. Thanks, Ronnie. Um, questions from the members of the committee? Okay, um, our next item tonight um, is working group update. And I just wanna start by extending my thanks to those members of our public relations working group who have been hard at work uh, thinking about the fun on the fourth and really trying to take advantage of this first public opportunity beyond our community forums uh, to get the word out there about this project. There's no question in my mind that once we pass into September and we have one singular option on the table, we will be working very strategically about um, making the community well aware of and informed of the project. But 
I want to thank the members of our public relations working group who have been hard to get us started with this upcoming opportunity um, this week. So I'll turn it over to them for an update. Thank you, Dr. Brand. And if I can ask um, Mike, if you wouldn't mind since to give an update, since you and Justin have been more intimately involved in conversations with the Fun on the Fourth Committee. Sure, uh, sure, Vivian. So yes, the um, as has been mentioned and referenced a couple times tonight, we have a table at Fun on the Fourth that begins tomorrow evening um, at I believe five thirty. Um, runs through the fireworks on Sunday. Um, we've had good participation so far on signups. We still are looking for some help on the Saturday evening, 7 to 10 p.m. We don't have any volunteers at the time. And then there's a Sunday time slot from 4 to 7 p.m. that's open. Um, but I did want to thank the school committee members, uh, Nick Golden, Dave Regsdale, Stephen Turner, and Michael Marcaldi have all signed up recently and filled a lot of spots. So that'd be very beneficial to help us cover those time periods. So what we have right now, if you've driven by the common, you'll see that there's various groups that have set their tents up. I believe everyone has to be set up tonight. We presently just have our tent, table, and chairs. Um, tomorrow night, I'll be at the tent uh, starting at 5.30. I'll be there earlier. We'll hang a banner from the back of the tent. Uh, we have table coverings. Dr. Brand, I'll be sending um, Tracy an email to try and find what time tomorrow afternoon best to pick up the couple poster boards. As a reference, we have a QR code. Um, if anybody has their phone and wants to take an anonymous Mentimeter poll, it's just five questions. We did a test of that. It's a very easy way to give feedback. At the same time, we're also going to have some um, sheets of and um, busy a box to let people give individual comments. We'll make sure they get tucked away safely in an envelope. Um, if you haven't had a chance to sign up and you are available, we would still be looking for people to sign up. Um, and then I think if you are just on the full, on the common at a different time and you're not signed up, please just stop by. It'd be good for a chance to chat with other committee members, maybe get some initial feedback from those who are in person. Um, to support the effort, there was a couple emails that went out. They've pretty much been the same. There's some talking points. Um, we worked to get, put some talking points together over the last couple of weeks. I think everybody got a draft copy last week. Um, a final copy was sent out today, but I don't really notice much difference. Um, I believe the understanding of the update is mostly so that these could be turned into a Q&A later on and posted on the town website. Um, what I'm gonna do for tomorrow is I'll print out a couple copies, put them in some clear laminate and have them in a binder. It's really just for committee reference, but if you are at the booth and you don't have a chance to look at these beforehand, it'd be a good quick reference. Um, a lot of it is who, what, where, why, when, and how um, to help answer consistent questions for the community and um, be able to get feedback. Uh, Vivian, not sure if anybody else on the committee wants to add anything. No, thank you so much, Mike. Thanks, Michael. And, um, and uh, just to reiterate these um, talking points that will turn into frequently asked questions later on the website are not for distribution purposes. They're merely for the committee members so we can give a consistent messaging and information throughout. Once they have been finalized, they will then appear and approved. Then they will appear on the project website under uh, frequently asked questions. Thanks, Vivian. Um, and unless there's anything else from members of the committee uh, on this, um, look forward to this first opportunity. Great, okay. Uh, shifting to item number six tonight, discussion correspondence and new items. A couple of items listed, uh, senior center visit update and projects naming. Um, I'll, I'll certainly start and Julie, you can add in. We had the opportunity to visit, uh, I guess it was about two weeks ago now, uh, senior center and been in conversation with uh, Terry there to try and provide an opportunity for us to bring information about this project to uh, to that group of our community. Uh, we had a small turnout, um, weren't able to quite get this, uh, I guess, into the newsletter. Um, but Ms. Allen, thank you. I know you were there, um, but it was uh, it was a helpful opportunity to talk through about uh, the project and, and think um, strategically and critically about how we can advance um, information um, and an understanding about it. Um, Julie, I don't know if you want to add or, or yeah. Ms. Allen too, if you want to chime in, you were there, so. I think it was great. I mean, I know that there was only a few people there, but 
we were able to sit and talk to them and not necessarily give them the, the whole presentation like we would in a community forum, but we were able to ask them questions. What, what do you think of the project? What have you heard about the project? Um, what concerns do you have? Um, and I think it was really important that we actually sat and listened as opposed to just talk. Um, and and um, Diane and her husband were there and they gave us uh, some pretty good insight um, as to what people in the town are thinking, um, some some questions that they had. And, and I'm gonna kind of segue this into the next bullet, which is the project naming. One thing that they brought to our attention is that people in the community hear that this is the Wildwood School Project. So they assume that means that it is just for the Wildwood School. Um, and, you know, we had kind of talked about this early on, but as that the Wildwood School was the one that was deemed the most in need, the MSBA um, project name is the Wilmington's Wildwood Early Childhood um, Center. So we, we had this conversation about, do we rebrand? You know, do we rebrand this and rename it to be something um, to the effect of, you know, the Wilmington Elementary School Project? Um, not that we would change the name with the MSBA, but change how we talk about it as a community. Um, and that was really insightful of, of Diane and, and Audrey, who was there, because Audrey said to us, I thought it was just for the Wildwood School. Um, and if that's the perception of one person, imagine what that is, you know, multiplied. I also work in another community. And um, when I was speaking to a member of that community who lives in Wilmington, she, you know, being in education said, oh, I had no idea that there were other options on the table. I thought it was just for the Wildwood School. And, and I'm hearing this from somebody who has someone uh, in the high school. So we bring this to your attention. Um, that you know, it might be an opportunity for us to, you know, rebrand the project. Um, part also of the senior center, as um, Dr. Brand mentioned, is that we did not have an opportunity to um, submit anything to their newsletter, which we have um, since done, and so we have now um, put a little blurb into their newsletter, and we will continue to do so. And our goal is to get back in at the end of August. Um, to the senior center, have another meeting with them. Hopefully, um, my understanding is re people really enjoy the newsletter and they read it cover to cover. So it's uh, they'll have more of an opportunity to know that we're coming at the end of August. Uh, can I ask how many attended the meeting at the senior center? Um, including Terry, there were four. Oh, okay. Is there any way we could get back in front of the senior center? prior to the August meeting? Um, I'd like to hear the senior feedback prior to, um, you know, us voting on an option. We discussed that with um, Terry while we were there. Um, and our, what we were intending to do was to go back at the end of August due to everyone's schedules. We can see if we can bump that up. I'm not sure what everybody's schedules look like. Um, but she had wanted us to get into her newsletter for a few months. Um, but we can we can circle back with her and see if we can get in before that. Um, I think it's very important to get the senior feedback in town on on what they would like to see in the school. Um, I, I mean, four people. Diane is there and her husband. It's yeah. not a very good turnout. <laughs> not a very good feedback moment. Well, we yeah. were. Well, that Diane and her husband did come is that they actually did provide us a lot of information and had a lot of questions that, you know, they've been getting from others and they were able to ask them. And so now we know what people are talking about. Right. But I, I really like to see, you know, some more participation from the other seniors in the building. The only thing is, let me add, if you want to do that, and I think that's a good idea, Marianne, to make it in July, um, that has to go in the July newsletter. And I would say as we're approaching, you know, Terry gets has to get all the information by about the third week of June here. Uh, June here. We're at the end of June right now. I don't know if she's ready to go to press with her newsletter. So if she is, and that isn't in it, how does she get the word out 
for a July meeting, you know? Let me ask you, Diane, when is the August meeting? Like the August newsletter, when would that be distributed to the seniors? So uh, since we used to help her with the write-up on the senior center and everything, let me look at July and I'll tell you in a second. Um, I would say she would want to have it by at least uh, the week of the 22nd of July uh, to be able to put something in there for an August meeting. Uh, maybe she could have it at the beginning of August. That's my thought. That's my thought is to- Yeah, we can, a... we can certainly, I can uh, reach out to Terry and we can explore that. Um, yeah. I, I do know it's the third week uh, certainly, Dan, as you, you, you said, um, and so we could certainly explore the possibility of something in early August. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, yeah, I think July you. is just, uh, you know, I mean, she can have it, but it's not going to be in the newsletter, which, re you know, goes out to over four, almost, you know, over 3,000 people that she mails these out to. So, um, you know, you want to get a good cross section, I would say, you know, hit it in the July newsletter that's going to uh, come out for August and uh, make it early August, early on. Yeah, I agree. We have a, but we do have a community engagement early in August that the seniors can participate in and not necessarily have a special one held a second time for them. Also with it, Please do remember that during the fun on the 4th, we'll be having a table where we'll be trying to attract as many voices from the community as possible. I'm not discrediting or I'm not trying to discourage us from going back to the senior center, but they're not the only voice that is crucial for this. And if you know we're going to get a good representation from the, from the town during the fun on the 4th, as well as already having gone to the senior center, maybe do a newsletter update. I feel as though we and have an August public forum. Have we not already done our due diligence? So it Vivian, just, if I may, uh, the seniors aren't that tech savvy to go in and you know log into the community forum, and for only having three seniors show up i think it i think it the town should make a little bit more of an effort and and do another forum for the seniors i mean we're doing you know the seniors aren't necessarily going to go to the fun on the floor that might attract more of the family atmosphere Fair. so I, I think you know an hour or two spent early august at the senior center would benefit the town. Thanks, Marianne. Uh, Eric and then David. Um, uh, thanks, Glenn. I just wanted to circle back to what Julie was mentioning about uh, potentially renaming the project. Um, as, as a person coming in at this from a little bit from the outside, um, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I think that uh, it becomes a much clearer uh, e even if all it does is spark a question as to why it's not called the Wildwood Project anymore, you're getting people to try to engage with what, what it, it as, a, as an elementary school project. Um, and secondly, not to kind of address the elephant in the room, I, I do think there are some concerns with connecting to some, some especially on, on some parents' concerns about the Wildwood. I mean, I think there's, there's that, that, there, there were some concerns about the, the, you know, the oil spill that happened there, and 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 it might be best to remove this project from that name, and just have it be a, an elementary school project. I think that would be clear for everybody. I think that would be, um, uh, um, uh, would would would, and I, the sooner we do it, the better, because the so then people will be able to ask those questions or make the realization that we're talking about something about that's that's more than just a pre-K through K potentially. Not That's just my two cents on that. Thanks, Eric. Uh, David. Uh, I largely echo the town manager, so I'll be, I'll be brief. I think it was worth it to meet with even just four people or three people just to get that insight that the name is not speaking to what the project really is. I think that is 
uh, an absolutely key <laughs> insight to gather that, uh, you know, we're not not looking at rebranding because, you know, it's not, you know, everyone hates Comcast. And so let's call some of our services Xfinity. But it's what the what we're calling the project is not conveying to people what it really is. And uh, and I think that's incredibly important for us to, to, to know. And, you know, once you hear it, it makes perfect sense. Thanks, David. Yeah, I, I would I would agree, and it was good feedback. You're right. Whether it was three people, four people, small number, and there's certainly a point taken, Mary. And it can't hurt to try again. Uh, but that there was some helpful nuggets that came from that conversation, including this one. Um, and so um, uh, I think we should pursue an adjustment in that name. Uh, Greg, uh, thank you, Dr. Brand. Yeah. So just uh, two quick points. Um, I, I the first one is I agree. If we can try to assemble. Uh, a larger group of seniors at the senior center this summer. I think that would be very beneficial. Uh, secondly, so I just want to be clear on the renaming. It's only in kind of uh, uh, in the spirit of branding, right? I mean, obviously we're we're mindful of the March eighth, twenty twenty two meeting, in which you know selfishly I was the one who made the the motion. So I want to make sure that I'm, I'm sticking to that mission. That this was a this was a twenty twenty two special town meeting vote to uh for a feasibility study to re replace the wildwood elementary school so i just want to make sure that we're not kind of shooting ourselves in the foot uh for lack of a better phrase uh because that was the original motion for this project i think i think it goes hand in hand with also the conveyance to the msba and to the school committee and to the select board of which, yes, the Wildwood was the target for the project, but also with um, uh, an eye to explore the possibility of school consolidation, which is obviously all at the elementary level. So I think if, if, if elementary school project or something of that sort is is part of the rebranding, uh, I think it still stays true to to that town vote, as you raised, Greg, in terms of what the, the priority project here is, which we are on record with, with the MSPA, and that is the Wildwood. It's the priority project. Uh, I think it's something referred to as. Yeah, well, yeah. Thank you. I hope no one gets me wrong here. I'm not. I think the intention is is a good one. That anytime we can be more clear about what we're uh, what our intentions are, I think that's a good thing. But I just wanted to make sure that we aren't uh, straying too far away from the original mission. Any other uh, any other thoughts or comments on that regarding project naming or uh, clear path for the thoughts for the senior center and a, a extension to try and uh, can connect with them again. Uh, Dennis. Yeah, in my experience um, in the past few years, you looked at when you can justify a project to the seniors, they'll come out and force and help you appropriate money and, and get it a pass through. Um, so any attempt to get more seniors involved can be definitely benefit the program um, and educating them on what the goal is and what we're trying to do and what how it's going to affect them. Obviously, um, I know that when they run luncheons and breakfasts and things like that, they get a a, a very good turnout. Um, there's certain days where um, restaurants or organizations donate things there and they get a good turnout. So maybe it doesn't have to be in the calendar, but it could be a, a stop by meeting and coordinated with um, Terry based on an event like that, where they have something and people just go in and, you know, have one-on-one -on -one conversations and meet with them. But I think they could benefit the project or at least help educate everyone that's going to vote later on. Yeah. Th thanks, Dennis. Uh, great suggestion. I, and I can also talk with Terry about whether or not there are upcoming events that maybe just having a presence wouldn't be at all a bad thing. So. Okay. Uh, moving on to item number, uh, oh, Judy. Saw your hand raise. Sorry for the late hand. Um, I do think the senior piece, I just want to reiterate that. And I, I know that may seem redundant, but the only concern that I have is that I don't know too many seniors that you're going to interact with that the number one question they're going to ask is how much is it going to cost and how much is it going to raise my taxes? And I, I heard loud and clear the concerns about having the cost estimates, but I just... I, I do think we have to really think about that. And I know we only can go with the information that we have, but that is going to be the almighty question that they're going to ask. And, and we just don't have that answer. I just want to, 
I may be speaking to what everyone's thinking. That is a huge concern. And I just don't know how, how we can adequately educate any population, but specifically seniors that, you know, may have a different financial structure than others that um, how we can help bridge some of those concerns and have those conversations in a bigger way. I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on that because you're basically going into these environments without the, the biggest key piece of information. I would agree with you, Julie. And I think it'd be more beneficial to go back to them once we've made, narrowed our option down and we do have a, we still have a window of time between making the decision and the determination which option to go forward with and town meeting and vote. That is the time frame that we need to extend all of our efforts to ensure that the information is out in the public, especially to the pub, uh, to the senior group. And we'll at that point also have actual dollars and numbers to give to them to answer their questions as far as how much reimbursement will the MSBA be contributing towards this project, as well as what the actual cost will be to them per household. Uh, Michael? Thank you, Dr. Brand. I think adding to both those points on the cost, um, Julie, if, if we could discuss it, a while back, I think I put together a little breakdown of of the you know the do nothing costs and the full costs, considering that the three schools need renovations. If we do pre-K to K, we need to consider work at Woburn and North. And if we do pre-K to three, we also have to consider work at the North. Um, can that breakdown be incorporated into whatever gets presented in August? Because I know I was just kind of playing with numbers, but the costs get a lot closer together when you start considering um, a potential payback for one building and then the town's cost for the others. And I think we really need to be able to look at all three schools, regardless of which option we build, because the remaining schools would need attention as well. And that's something the town has to budget for. Right. Thanks, and, and we... We've had that conversation um, in our leadership group with um, with Dennis Kelly, and you know he did bring up a valid point, which is, you know, although we say that it's twenty nine million dollars to renovate a building, that twenty nine million dollars doesn't have to be done all at once. It can be, you know, spread out over several years, you know, depending upon what his budget looks like. That that actual building, we'll just use the um, we'll use the Wildwood as just as, as an example, it's not going to change the size of the classrooms. It's not gonna change the corridors. It's gonna, you know, fix the the windows, the roof, the, you know, uh, mechanical systems and, and things like that and bringing it up to code. That's but, true. you know, not not all at once. Maybe I shouldn't have used the Wildwood because the Wildwood would be all at once, but other locations would not have to necessarily be all at once and it could be parsed out over time. Um, the problem with that is that these are today's dollars, right? And if we don't do this work all at once, that cost just goes up because it escalates every year. And so, you know, we have factor some escalation into that, but not as much, I don't believe, as, you know, if we were going out to 10 years to fix some of these buildings. And these buildings, you know, are meant to last 50 years. Um, so. Marianne. So to go back to um, Judy's point, I guess my question is, does the vote have to take place in August? Yes. Yeah. What would be the consequences if it didn't? Are we just delaying it a couple months? So we are on the MSBA schedule. Okay. Um, and, and we follow that schedule that we've provided to them um, to okay. be to do our project scope and budget agreement um, and to, to stay on their track. We'd have to have a conversation with the MSBA um, like we did a few months ago about delaying the project. Um, I, I just asked because, you know, we're gonna be asked the question, say the committee votes a pre-K through five, as an example, and the numbers come back astronomical and the hit to the taxpayer is substantial. We're going to be asked the question, why didn't you do a pre-K through three? And we didn't get really much feedback from the community 
with dollar amounts on what they would like to do. That's my biggest concern that we put forward a project that's going to might fail at town meeting because we didn't have the numbers. We didn't really get the community input with numbers. Nick. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. And, and yeah, I mean, Marianne, I think that's like a fundamental kind of concern about any kind of public process, right? Is when do we think we have enough public input and how do we, because always inevitably there are people who will say, I wasn't consulted, I didn't know about this. Um, unfortunately, that's just kind of part and parcel of, of like our representative process. Um, you know, uh, I think inevitably we'll have some of that, but I think we're doing plenty of great stuff. I mean, you know, we're gonna be tabling. Uh, I know not everyone goes to fun on the fourth, but we're definitely beginning the, the voice out there. And I know, I mean, there's potential for us to do kind of a broader public campaign once we have an option before town meeting. You know, there's nothing stopping people from getting their voices out there, sharing information. In terms of an idea for like the next month, forgive me, I'm, I'm still kind of new to this, but forgive me if this is not something that is workable, but could we not put the QR code on the newsletter? I have it in front of me right now, the senior newsletter. Um, you know, I know it's not the easiest thing for everybody, of course, to even know what a QR code is, but people go to restaurants, you would use them for your menu. They're kind of out there. So if we're still running our, our survey at the time when the newsletter would hit people's mailboxes, it could be a really quick way to say, open your phone, scan it, go on your phone and answer questions. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but it is a possibility. Have we, maybe that's something we could do. Nick, that's a great question. I, I, I think um, I, I think it, there's no reason why we couldn't. There's no reason as well um, that we can't extend that opportunity um, after the community forum. Just as a reminder, and I know we talked about this before, but as a reminder for everybody, the last community forum that we did, um, uh, we had approximately 90 or some odd folks in attendance virtually. Um, and that QR code, the opportunity for feedback stayed open for at least a week after that meeting. And um, I'm told by uh, Jason and, and his team that we had that many more people who took the opportunity to weigh in who could not attend that meeting. So the point is um, when we're able to grab people's attention, even if it's not in the moment, but after the fact, there still is interest here and we're still able to gather uh, that feedback. So I think that's a a great idea and i think that's something we could certainly uh, very easily push out um michael dr brent i this may be more of a question uh, for smma and dora whittier for so on slide seven we have obviously the preliminary numbers from the earlier phase um are those on the poster boards that we're gonna have tomorrow and if not can we have something similar that I can print out so we have those preliminary cost numbers. Again, it's from an earlier phase of the project, but I mean, those are the preliminary numbers that we're kind of working with. And um, we can all guesstimate, you know, a low to medium reimbursement and what that could mean from those numbers. So excellently put as Dennis has said, we know we're getting tens of millions of dollars. It just depends on the project scale. I'm looking at the presentation and I don't believe the numbers are on there. Um, nope, they are on there. I can show you what the board looks like. I can share, share my screen and everyone can see what the board looks like. Right. So I believe these. This is what we're we're showing. And and if I could just add, Nan, Julie, that would be something that even uh, you know a brief meeting at the senior center with something like that to explain to them. Uh, you know, naturally, you may have the name rebranding going on. But um, this pamphlet is, I think, very um, informative. And it just gives everybody an idea of what you're talking about 
with regard to cost because that is on everybody's mind, uh, especially people who have children that are in the high school that are no longer in elementary school. Um, and then you have the senior group. So, you know, you have a good cross section of people here involved. Um, you know, some of these people that even attended this forum, you know, maybe having children in <laughs> the elementary school level or pre-K level, they may not even see the school. Uh, by the time this thing gets built, uh, you you could conceivably be talking five or six years before the doors are finally open. And uh, if you were to go to the pre-K through five, they their tax dollars, you know, wouldn't even be uh, a part of what their children will have the advantage of. So um, uh, I think that pamphlet is very, very informative and would be something that I think the seniors, as well as any information you're you're having uh, at the booth, um, because the bottom line is the money. It's it's, it, and if you don't think that, I, I I really think you're whistling in the wind to you, because everybody wants to know the dollar amount, and um, but they want they want good value for their dollar too. They want good value for their dollar. And of course, they understand what happened with the Wildwood School, and they they obviously understand that there has to be a replacement somewhere along the line. And uh, but um, but I think that um, the dollar value is going to be a very very big factor here, and in, in having them understand uh, before the final option is picked. So um, I agree with Marianne and what Julius. Uh, uh, saying here, um, and I hope that we use this pamphlet and get it out. Thanks, Dan. Uh, David? So uh, when we make the decision uh, in August to narrow ourselves to a single project, I think that it ultimately is needs to be based on on two things. And one is fundamentally, what do we think is in the best interest of the town factoring in everything. So that's factoring in the cost and the taxes and the educational needs and, and so forth. Uh, so that's number one. But number two is also picking an option that not only we think is in the best interest of the town, but that we can convince the rest of the town is as well, that we can convince people to ultimately support at town meeting, um, because that obviously we need we need that positive vote uh, in order for that to go forward. So we need to be thinking about about both sides of it. You know what is best, and what will people believe is best, and that we can ultimately convince people is best. Um, with the money, I agree that that's absolutely a, you know a huge factor that everyone's going to be wondering, well, like well you know, but what's the cost? But I I do want to caution that the money is very complicated because like in a lot of cases. It's well compared to what? So if we go down one route, we're spending money in this way, but then there are other needs that have to be addressed in a different way or addressed later on. Uh, and so it's a little bit it's a little bit hard to simplify uh, what the money factor is going to be. And that's especially true. I think one of the things that the the last set of slides we were just looking at, that only looking at the, cost estimates for the projects, uh, people looking at that are not going to remember that the MSBA is going to be con you know, making a contribution. And so it's really important if we're going to try to talk about, you know, or I should say if, when we talk about the money, that we, we try to give a full picture of the different financial ramifications, like what realistically it actually is going to be, what the MSBA is picking up, what the town is picking up. And if the town doesn't pick up this money here, well, what does that then look like when we need to address some of the schools in a different way? Um, I, I think we absolutely have to meet this head on, uh, but it's it's important to give context and not mislead people uh, with kind of you know simple numbers that don't reflect the real reality. Thanks, David. Um, we've kind of uh, transitioned, I think, into public, uh, sorry, not public, committee questions, comments. I just want to check just, other, just a, other questions. Kevin. Yeah, yeah just a, a quick comment. I, you know, I agree with uh, Diane and, and Marianne and, and uh, Judy. Um, 
it, it, it comes down to the uh, almighty dollar and what it's going to cost. And, and is, uh, you know, there's going to have to be an override for this. Uh, and, and I think we need to look at the big picture, as David mentioned, and and be realistic um, in getting back to what's been stated before about what, you know, if you're building uh, a pre-K to five, then we want a pre-K to five over at the Shashin. And I mean, you're talking about uh, 500 to 600 uh, million dollars, right? Uh, when you get get to it, but I look at a pre-K to three, which is which is uh, something that I would uh, more than likely support. You, you can put in two pre-K to threes for the price of one pre-K to five, um, and then you'll maintain the other two buildings uh, for the fourth and fifth graders. But um, I, I, I think. It's going to come down to what it's going to cost the taxpayer. Uh, and uh, I just want to be, we, we need to be realistic about, about this when we get into August and make our selections. Thanks, Kevin. Um, any other questions or comments from members of the committee before turning it um, open to public comment tonight? Okay, um, seeing none, uh, we'll move to item number eight, which is public comment. Uh, we do have a um, handful of folks, it looks like seven perhaps that are here in attendance. Um, and if there's anyone here from the public uh, that would, might wish to make comments, um, certainly would, would be welcome to do so at this time. Ken, can you uh, help out if you would? Uh, if you could, when you uh, are called upon, if you could state your name and your address, please. Uh, Ms. Feeney. Hi, Michelle Feeney, 5 Arlene Ave. Um, I want to thank the committee. It seems like a lot of work has gone into this. Um, I have so many questions, so I'm wondering, I may table those and just send them to the email. Is there one email that I can send those questions to to get an answer? Uh, thank you for asking that. And the answer is yes, there is. Um, I don't, uh, Julie, do you have that by chance? Um, it, it is listed on the website. Just, just to be clear, I, sorry, I don't have it right, right. Um, in my fingertips, but there is one. And um, Ms. Vina, I can get that to you. Uh, or if you're on the website, if you visit there, the, that is the email to use. And that's, is, is that, go, does that go to all committee members? Like if I were to encourage the community to submit feedback, is that the same email that they would send it to? Um, that is routed to right now, I think to myself, to the OPM. Uh, I believe that's it, I think at this point in time. We, we haven't at this at this juncture received, I think maybe one or two, not many uh, to this not point many. in time, but certainly uh, those questions that they come in, the intention would be to share them with the committee as a whole. Yes. Okay, those are the questions, but I'm wondering if like people had concerns about which of the options. Um, I guess this leads to my first question. I have two that are important. One, what happens to the land if option three is chosen for the pre-K to five? What happens to the land at the Wuben Street and what happens to the land at the Wildwood? That's the first question. Um, the second question I have is, I know that there was talk about providing messages and there's a table on the fourth. Um, what what will be pushed? Will all three options be equally um, mentioned or is there one option that will be highlighted and um, given to the public at the fun on the fourth table? If I may answer that, Michelle, um, at this moment, we are staying very neutral. We wanna hear from the community on what their desired out option is. And our objective is just to merely listen and obtain as much information as possible. We do not have one agenda that we will be pushing at this time. Great. And then to the first question, what happens to that land? That, I believe, is a question for the select board and not one that I can respond to. Has it come up in this committee? Has any talk in this committee come up about what happens to that land? Uh, I'll answer that briefly, but I would still encourage Ms. Feeney to submit that as a question because we also want to generate responses to these questions 
um, and to amass them as a frequently asked question aspect of the project. Uh, but that does not fall under the purview of this committee. I can answer that. Uh, that that's a that's a question that will uh, have to be answered um, by the by the town. Okay. Thanks um, so much, Dr. Brand. People have been posting in the chat um, the email address. However, I believe it's only going to the panelists. It's not going to the attendees. So I just want to make sure. I'm not okay. sure. Steve, it's, it's been disabled the entire time. Yeah, so seven of us who joined. Yeah, I just want to make sure um, we can. Um, it's on the project's website, but I can give it to you, which is it's very simple. It's Wildwood Project Questions at wpsk12.com. Thank you, Julie, um, and thanks, Ms. Feeney, for that. Uh, are there any other questions from members of the public here this evening? Uh, looks like there's one hand raised. Uh, Stephen, you could uh, kindly introduce yourself uh, by name and your address. Please. Good evening. This is Stephen Turner, 59 Washington Avenue. Um, a couple of different things. One quick point on the larger discussion about getting feedback um, from the senior community to kind of combine several of the points that were made by Mary Ann and Diane and Nick. In the senior letter, if you did a hard copy survey, some of those folks would be very willing to drop that off, I believe, at the senior center, and we could aggregate those separately. That might be a more effective way to get feedback than a QR code. Just a, a thought there. Um, but I think if we're trying to engage with people where they are, that might be the best way. And then, and then certainly having an opportunity, the timing, I would defer to you guys as to the best timing to go back, but going back, I certainly think in person would, would be a great idea. And the other thing I was I was hoping the project manager could speak to was the the time cost to delay. So if we were to pick an option, and an option addresses part of our concerns for the schools on the north side of town, what sort of factor do we see currently in the construction market to current estimates for cost? So just as an example, if we did the pre-KK only, and we needed to look at either repair, replacement, whatever in the future for one through five, what sort of, is it 3%, 5%, 10% a year that the average construction cost increases so that we know if we did this smaller project now in five or 10 years when we could get to the next one, how much are the cost estimates likely rough to have increased over a decade? You know, if you could address that sort of a topic of, of what you've seen in the industry, what you've seen in that, that part of your world, that'd be very helpful. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, Lee, maybe you want to speak to that? Sure. I, I think it's a great question. And in general, we're seeing four to five percent escalation on construction costs for year to year. The, the important thing here is when you're looking at just the repair projects, right? They are that in scope, just repair. And so it wouldn't be the same as if you pick that pre-K K new option, right? Has all of the educational programming that we were looking to provide. And the repair options, while they have a cost, just extend the lives of the buildings. If they don't do anything to educational. So from a monetary standpoint, we can be able to project what that would be like on opening day of, you know, whatever option is picked and the remaining schools that needed to be repaired, what the escalation cost would be. That was one of the tools we could provide the committee for those decision making opportunities in July and August. I To follow up on that, thank you. Um, thank you very much for that point. I think part of the evaluation matrix then could reflect time value of money to everyone else's points about money to say not only is it red in those areas where it's talking about educational needs, it's X sort of cost now. And if we have to delay 5, 10, 15 years on that repair or add reno at that location, it would be that much more. It's not just, for example, you know, third just. It's not 30 million to repair the North today. If we waited 10 years to do it, not only would we be read in that column, it would be 40 million or whatever the number, 45, whatever that number would be. Um, so I think that would be helpful information for the community. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, any other members of the community here tonight? Just ask a question.
I believe Miss Feeney raised her hand a second time. Actually, uh, Mr. De Palmer had raised his hand. I just let him. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Gary De Palmer, 46 Wayne Road. I want to compliment the committee to start out with. I haven't agreed with everything that you have proposed in the time frames, but I will say I have never seen a harder working group than I've seen with you. The biggest question you're going to have right now, and this is what I'm getting feedback on, is how much is it going to cost? Everyone is accepting the fact, I believe, or the majority, I should say, is accepting the fact that we are going to be building a new school for the town of Wilmington. The concern is how much. You hear rumors running around that it's going to be X amount of dollars, uh, this dollar, that dollar, and it has a lot of con uh, people concerned, especially people on fixed incomes. And that's including myself. I am retired, and I see what is going to happen to my tax rate uh, as a uh, resident of Wilmington and a homeowner of Wilmington. I know it's going to go up. The concern I have, and I believe you'll find a lot of people will have this, by how much. And I believe that they would sit there and, uh, and support whatever you bring up. There's going to be the negatives. There always is. But I believe you'll have more positives when you come out and say, hey, this is what we want to build. Uh, no deviations. Uh, you know, there's always tweaking of a project, of course. But if you come out and say, we're going to do A and that's it. I believe you'll have more uh, people more concerned, uh, will be more supportive because they'll know. And, and then the big question is going to be, and believe me when I say this, I get a lot of feedback on it, is what's it going to cost us in taxes? We don't know what the MSBA is going to actually uh, give us because we don't have a project uh, for them to uh, cost out yet. Once you tell them, I'm assuming, once you tell them this is what we're going to do, everyone's in agreement, then they're going to be able to cost it out and say this is what it's going to cost. As far as the uh, uh, buildings that won't be uh, used anymore, uh, most of the time when the school is done, school department is done with a, a building or a piece of land, they'll convey it back over to the town. And then it can go into the town's uh, property. Uh, that's one thing that you can do. Uh, but I want to compliment you again. I want to thank you. I'm never going to have any children that go to this school. I know a lot of people that are walking around with little babies who are saying that I don't think my kids are going to be seeing this school or maybe the last year before they move on. Uh, but they're still supporting it. So... I want you to understand that the town is an educational town. They want the best education they can get for their children. And me as a senior, that's what I want because they're our future. Again, thank you and have a good night. Thank you, Mr. DeBama. And uh, thank you for the shout out. It's a really hardworking committee and who's doing great work on behalf of the town. So thank you for acknowledging that. Uh, Ms. Feeney, I think uh, you are up next. Yeah, you know, the other question I have is, um, I'm just curious as to why this would not, why the three options wouldn't go to the town vote versus the one, because it seems to me that once the committee decides on just one option, then it just becomes a PR exercise between that time and the town meeting to convince everyone of the option that the committee chose. Why Why wouldn't you at least let the town choose? I mean, you've done the work, you've done the feasibility studies, which I may ask, did those include traffic studies as well? I'm just wondering, that's a yes or no. Like, did you include traffic studies during school hours and school times in, in the feasibility study? The traffic study will be done on the one site that's selected, um, not all three sites. Yeah. I Any reason why? I feel like that is a major, you're combining three schools into one. The traffic would be um, really impacted, especially on that side of town where all, the, all of the industry is, 
the highway exits. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious as to why, if you did the mega elementary school, it would be like to not have a traffic feasibility study. And I don't want to um, derail my first question um, as to why this wouldn't be brought to a town vote. This is a pretty significant amount of spending. I don't understand why the town wouldn't be allowed to choose which of the three options and vote on those. Sure. Uh, good question, Ms. Feeney, and an understandable one. Um, and I, I, I know the answer, but I'll ask our owner's project manager who's representing the interests of, uh, of the town on this project to weigh in on that. Thank you. Um, so the process with the MSBA is that when the community submits their statement of interest, they, in addition, create a school building committee. And that school building committee um, has the purview to vote in each project. We started off with a um, smaller committee, which they have to have representation from the select board, the finance committee, the permanent building committee, and the school committee. There is a, a requirement from the MSBA. Um, and then we've extended it out. Um, that smaller group um, hired the OPM and then we hired the design team. Um, and from there, we had thoughtful conversations about how do we extend this group to include educators, um, special educators, administration, parent representatives, um, town manager, assistant town manager. Um, and so we've expanded it from what it was to the, the 22 members that it currently is. And those 22 members are the governing body of this project. Um, what we've done is we have had um, numerous community forums where we've reached out to the community to get their feedback to help this group decide what the one option is to move forward. Um, they are a represented, representation of your town. Um, and so, as we mentioned earlier, fun on the fourth, um, community forums, going to the senior center, you know, we're taking these, um, Glenn has done some road shows uh, with the PACs at all of the schools um, to try and get the word out so that people are able to voice their opinion and help this committee to determine which road to go down. Um, but ultimately the MSBA only allows us to move forward into schematic design one option. Um, and that one option has to be voted on by the school building committee, um, which the matrix that we showed earlier helps us determine, you know, which one to move forward along with the community feedback. Who did the scoring for the matrix? Was that this group? Yes. Okay. I just, I, I really am just concerned about the fact that there will be no traffic study until one option is chosen. What happens if it's a what Ms. Feeney, I'm gonna if you could um sorry, but we wanna we wanna try and bring this to a close. I, I would ask if you would please to um uh that, that email is gonna be a, a key piece and you're more than welcome to um certainly include uh, sure. your questions through there if you if you would and the next is so the community forum on August seventh, will that be a full hour of community asking questions so it's not limited to the last like 10 minutes of the meeting? So it will be a virtual meeting and we will give our presentation on, you know, <sighs> what the options are. And then the community can talk as long as they want. They can ask as many questions as they'd like. It's okay. not, there's no time limit. I just have to say, I've been part of many of these meetings and they all follow the same path. Everyone is, it. it the presentation is done. It leads everyone down a path. Everyone chooses and scores leading down the path that was already chosen, in my opinion, from the beginning. It does not seem like you're allowing for feedback. And I'm very concerned that, I, like, is there, a feasi is there a place to look at the feasibility studies and what went into each of those locations? And, yep. we, okay, that's, is that on the site? Because I just, I didn't see sure, it. Sure, yeah, I can respond. And, I can and again, to. I think traffic is a major issue. I have driven my two children to the high school in the morning. And when I tell you the traffic from the cars coming off of 93 on Middlesex, I can't even fathom three schools if you were to choose the mega elementary option, um, which is the most expensive, I will uh, also comment on. 
Okay, well, thank you. I guess I'll look forward to the next forum when the community can actually have a, thank, a little thanks, bit more commentary. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms. Feeney. Uh, and just as a note for all, and as a reminder for everyone in the community watching either this evening or in, uh, or in uh, a future point in time, all of the information, all of the presentations, of which I know it's a lot, it's an awful lot of information at this point, um, is widely available on the school district's website. Uh, there was a decision some time ago between a uh, town manager and myself that it would make the most sense to amass all of this information off of the school district's website, which makes perfect sense to me. Um, it is widely available, um, and uh, I'll just also put a plug into the fact that uh, the next meeting, uh, we have one more meeting prior to the forum uh, that was mentioned in early August, and that is on July 23rd, again, to try and provide uh, accessibility and the ability for those knowing that it's the summer months uh, in our community who may wish to chime in or to join. Um, we, we've decided to hold that July 23rd meeting remotely as well. Um, so thank you for members of the community who took the time tonight. As always, we will make sure that this broadcast and this recording is made available to the community as well. Um, Ms. O'Connell, last word before we move for adjournments. Yes, just you know, for the benefit of um, Ms. Feeney, because she did have some questions, and I know that we provided the uh, email address. How are emails being handled? Is someone responding back expeditiously to people that email in so that they get feedback and not have to wait until the next meeting? so that they can continue dialogue. So that time, you know, if it sounds like Ms. Feeney has more to say and we, we've run out of time, you know, I just don't want her to have to wait, you know, another month to get a response because it has to go back to a committee. Are people actively engaging with residents, you know, for Q&A on a daily basis? Um, yes, the short answer is yes. And we're not waiting until the next meeting, but the, um, the actual answer is I think it's maybe one or perhaps two emails that have, have been received through okay. this email account um, since the inception of the committee. So uh, we, to this point in time, um, are not receiving traffic that way. All of the feedback has been through the community forums. Um, okay. Largely. So, yeah. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that, you know, um, do those emails go to you, Dr. Brand, or who do they, who do they go they do. to? Do they, yeah. they do. Okay. Yeah, they do. They, okay. do. they also come to me. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and the intention, again, uh, I think I may have, if I didn't, I'll mention it now, to take these questions as they come in, uh, you know, remove any identifying information, but to start to compile them as a Q&A. Uh, and that will, you know, kind of build over, over time. Because I do expect mm -hmm. that the traffic will increase, the questions will come, um, and we want to be responsive uh, to right. them and also make sure that, uh, you know, it's if one person has that question, it's undoubtedly that of many others. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that those are available and we will post those on the FAQ, uh, on what will become an FAQ portion of the website. I appreciate that just because, you know, I had the same question today during our meeting earlier in the day today in preparation for tonight with concerns about traffic and traffic patterns and in, in highway exits, et cetera also to time with students on buses, et cetera. So I think, I know that a lot of work's been done up to this point, but sometimes people are coming into this project at different points in history. And sometimes there may need to be kind of a reiteration of certain Q and A that's happened in prior meetings because we're picking up people along the trail or people are you know getting more entrenched into the project as it's coming further and further to fruition. So um, I, th I think, you know, as we move closer to decision making, I, th I think there'll be there should be, and I expect to be a ramp up across the board because we're getting down to brass tacks with actually having to make a decision. Thanks, James. Yeah, I agree. Um, as mentioned, our next meeting is July twenty third. Um, <clears throat> covered an awful lot of information tonight, so thank you for your time, attention, um, and commitment. Continued commitment to the project. Looking for a motion to adjourn tonight. So moved. Thank you. A second. Second. Uh, thank you. Um, Vivian? Uh, Diane Allen? Yes. Greg Bendel? Yes. Kate Bissell? Yes. Glenn Brand? Yes. Kevin Kyra? Yes. Michael Camosio? Yes. Eric Slagle? Yes. Nick Golden? Yes. Justin Couchet? Yes. Marianne Galezzo? Yes. Christine Holleran? Yes. Dennis Kelly? Yes. 
Christine Prendergast? Yes. David Ragsdale? Yes. Paul Ruggiero? Yes. Judy O'Connell? Yes. And myself, yes. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. Thanks. Good night, everyone.